Did you know that if you take too much zinc, it might cause a copper and iron deficiency? Or that if you take vitamin D on an empty stomach, it probably won't be absorbed. And most vitamin C supplements are potentially toxic. There are so many small mistakes that you might be making with your supplements. If you're spending all that money, you may as well make sure that it's not just expensive urine. Hi, my name's Amy Leisha. I'm obsessed with health and I have done a deep dive on supplement research and I'm gonna give you everything you need to know right now. I'm I'm going to cover the crucial difference between fat soluble and water soluble vitamins and why that matters, what supplements you can mix and what you can't, the problem with multivitamins, the dark side of the supplement industry, the dangers of vitamin C and fish oil, why you might be taking the wrong magnesium, the one vitamin everyone should be taking and the truth about supplements and a good diet. There are timestamps below so feel free to skip around. Okay, water soluble and fat soluble vitamins, why do they matter? Let's start with water soluble vitamins. These are your vitamin C and and B complex. They need water to be absorbed and they can be taken on an empty stomach with water for good absorption. These vitamins, however, do not stay in your system for long periods of time. Your body uses what it needs then flushes out the rest. So basically you end up weighing out anything that isn't used. So if you're consuming more than you need, it just becomes a waste of money. Water soluble vitamins Bs and Cs are found in animal products, fruit and veg. C vitamins are highest in plant foods like kiwi fruits, kakadu plums, cruciferous veggies and citrus fruits. So now let's take a look look at fat soluble vitamins. These include vitamins A, D, E, and K. These require dietary fat to be absorbed and they are stored in the body. These are best taken after a meal containing some fat. So you really don't wanna be taking these on an empty stomach because they're not gonna have an absorption that is anywhere near as good as if it's taken with food. And fat soluble vitamins tend to come from animal and dairy products in their highest, most bioavailable forms. They can also be found in some fruits and veg, however, in much lower amounts that may not be sufficient and may not actually be able to be digested or absorbed as efficiently. So it's important to make sure that you're only taking what you need. Get your levels checked and when in doubt, don't take more than the recommended daily amount. Next, let's take a look at mixing supplements without understanding the interactions. The thought of popping a bunch of vitamins each day to fix any ailments to make you feel like you're a 20 year old athlete who has more energy than they can express and doesn't need to sleep sounds great. But unfortunately, there is more to supplementation than downing a handful of pills each morning. Some vitamins and minerals don't play nice together and they can cancel each other out. This can also make taking the precious expensive little gems an absolute waste and may even cause new or worse deficiencies. So what are some of the main ones to look out for? Let's start with zinc and iron. Zinc can cause iron deficiency and anemia. Research has shown that when iron and zinc are supplemented together, iron absorption was not as great as when given alone. Iron did not seem to affect the zinc though. So if you have too much zinc, it is very likely to negatively affect your copper and iron levels. Supplementing them together, the zinc is just gonna cancel out the iron. So that becomes an absolute waste. So you wanna make sure that they are separate. Okay, magnesium and supplemental zinc. One study found that high doses of zinc from supplements of 142 milligrams per day can interfere with magnesium absorption and disrupt magnesium in the body. Again, yet another thing that's gonna affect magnesium absorption. People tend to have more of a magnesium deficiency these days with the magnesium content in the soil being a lot lower. So they're not actually getting the same amount of magnesium from foods. If you didn't have any issues with magnesium beforehand, you might end up if you are over consuming zinc. Moving on to vitamin C and B12. Taking vitamin C with B12 can potentially reduce the amount of B12 absorbed in the body. Both are very important. However, they should be taken hours apart. So you don't wanna be taking vitamin C and B12 together, which is very interesting because both C and B12 are water soluble vitamins. And if you are taking a multivitamin and it has C and B12 in it, you're probably not going to be getting the most out of them and the best benefit if C is interacting with B's absorption. Now looking at iron, coffee and green tea. So iron and green tea, they all are healthy. However, when combined or taken close together, green tea and coffee can actually affect iron absorption as well. Research has found that both coffee and green tea reduce iron absorption in the non-heme form Form, which is not as readily absorbed by the body as heme iron. And non-heme iron is mostly found in plant foods and supplements. Heme iron is in animal products. So the iron that you get from animal products is more readily absorbed than that that you find in plant foods or supplementation. And excessive consumption of green tea and coffee has been linked to anemia. So if you are taking an iron supplement and drinking heaps of coffee or green tea, it may be completely pointless. Taking them at least two hours apart 
should suffice. Next, looking at zinc and copper, zinc may inhibit the absorption of copper. The deficiency is due to an interaction between zinc and copper. So zinc pretty much binds to the copper, so the copper can't be absorbed. Zinc wins, copper loses. It is worthwhile assessing when you consume them, what with and what levels you're taking. This is where multivitamins do start to get tricky because if you have one multivitamin that is filled with so many different vitamins and minerals, they may be interacting with each other. They may not be in good levels and the absorption might actually be affected. So let's take a look at the problem with multivitamins. Are multivitamins actually worth taking? They're pretty much just a low dose of a bunch of essential vitamins and minerals, usually marketed at a certain people group. So you would have men's multivitamins, women's multivitamins, kids' multivitamins. It is a bunch of vitamins all mixed together. Research suggests that maybe they aren't worth taking at all. Assessing over 21,000 people in the US, 30% of multivitamin users reported better health than those who took nothing. However, when assessing health markers, there was actually no difference between the two groups. So it may have just been placebo. John Hopkins assessed a bunch of studies and determined multivitamins don't reduce the risk of heart disease, cancer, cognitive decline, or early death. So if they're the reasons that you're taking a multivitamin, don't because it isn't actually going to help with any of those things. There is very little research to suggest that multivitamins are actually beneficial. I would say a targeted approach is always going to be better. And with all the interactions and requirements for certain vitamins we've already spoken about, multivitamins may not have good absorption for some of the vitamins in them. That's not to say that multivitamins are a complete waste of money though. There is not enough specific research to suggest whether there is no benefit at all. And if the placebo factor is enough for you, you might actually notice that you feel good. Okay, let's take a look at the dark side of the supplement industry. Not choosing a reputable brand and ignoring quality and safety is quite a problem. A lot of vitamins are unregulated and have random fillers, casings, preservatives, etc. There is no global regulation or consensus on how to categorize or deal with supplementation. This makes safety weird and unknown and is varied country to country. In the US, supplements don't require approval from a governing body to go on the market. Supplement companies companies are responsible for having evidence that their products are safe and that their labels are true and not misleading. They don't need FDA approval. So it is important to find reputable brands who have been assessed by a governing body to prove that they are safe and do contain what they say they contain. So how do you pick a good supplement from a dodgy one? Firstly, look for a seal from the NSF International, UL, NPA, USP, Informed Choice, Banned Substance Control Group, or another certified party that has actually tested the product. Purchase from a reputable retailer, vitamin store, or a health professional. Although this isn't always foolproof, it is going to make the process easier. You know it's gonna be a better brand if it's coming from a reputable source. Still always good to check further. Check the packaging for the label, what the dietary supplement is, the manufacturer, the location, the ingredients that are in it, the amounts of the ingredients, the transparency of the ingredients, and it's not a proprietary blend that could have anything in it and an address and phone number you can contact. Also, go onto their website, check frequently asked questions and get in contact with them to ask questions if you're still unsure. If they are happy and willing to answer all of your questions and are very transparent about their product testing, quality and certification, then that's a pretty good green light. Don't be fooled by big writing saying natural, organic, backed by science, FDA approved. This could just be marketing. Do the checks, make sure the claims are actually true. If you are concerned about fraudulent products, you can search the FDA's health fraud database to see if the products are already listed there. Moving on to dangers of vitamin C and fish oil. Ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Most ascorbic acid is actually synthetic and is not naturally found in plants. Often ascorbic acid is made from GMO corn and is chemically processed with acetone to create it. It goes through a lot of chemical processing to make, which absolutely blew my mind when I found out because I thought vitamin C was vitamin C and I did not realize that majority of the vitamin C pretty much worldwide in supplement form is actually synthetically made through chemical processing and often contains genetically modified substances which actually may be toxic in themselves. A 2001 study showed that synthetic
synthetic vitamin C may contribute to the formation of genotoxins that can lead to cancer. Research does suggest that there is greater bioavailability in natural vitamin C versus the synthetic form. Basically, they looked at vitamin C from fruits and that lower doses were more readily absorbed than higher doses of the synthetic versions. This is obviously really small research, so we do need to see a lot more research on this topic. Genetically modified food is a concern and many people go out of their way to avoid GMOs. It has been shown that vitamin C has an antioxidative effect and a pro-oxidative effect, where high doses may actually have a negative effect rather than a positive one. An American doctor said this, the vitamin C in supplements mobilize harmless iron stored in the body and converts it to harmful iron, which induces damage to the heart and other organs. Unlike the vitamin C naturally present in foods like orange juice, vitamin C as a supplement is not an antioxidant. So an antioxidant is good. Pro-oxidant, bad. We don't want oxidation in the body. Oxidation leads to aging and disease. Now, this is his research in studies, so it is, again, really small. So I think it is important to be aware of what we're taking and where did it come from? Is the body able to break down these synthetic chemically processed vitamins or does it treat them like toxins? So what is natural vitamin C? Your best bet is to find your vitamin C in food and eating it there. If you do need to supplement it for whatever reason, because it's low, finding supplements that do say vitamin C from fruit rather than ascorbic acid. Because if it does say ascorbic acid, it is very, very likely that it is synthetic. Let's take a look at fish oil. It's very likely rancid. More than one in 10 fish oil supplements tested from among 60 large retail brands are rancid, while nearly half of them are just under the recommended maximum limits of rancidity, according to independent tests. Rancid meaning they have oxidized and gone bad. Taking supplements that have gone bad may provide more harm than good and are just an absolute waste of money. George Washington Research found that 45% of fish oil supplements may not be fresh enough to deliver the health benefits consumers are seeking. So if pretty much half the fish oil on the market isn't going to deliver you the benefit that you are after, that's pretty concerning. How do you know a fish oil is rancid? Well, start with the sniff test. If it smells fishy and tastes fishy, it's probably rancid. When you do get your fish oil, store it in a cool, dark, dry place to maintain freshness. And when purchasing, companies that have dark glass or UV blocking packaging is a good step forward as it will also improve its freshness. The same steps will apply when doing the research on reputable brands. You wanna check the company, you wanna check the packaging, you wanna ask questions to find out when they were manufactured, when it was put on the shelf. Is it a good reputable company that doesn't start rancid to begin with to just ensure you are buying a quality product. Okay, moving on to why you might be taking the wrong magnesium. Magnesium is a really important essential mineral in the body and we really can't function without it. Unfortunately, up to 50% of the US population is magnesium deficient. So you may be deficient and taking a supplement, but is the supplement even working? Not all magnesium supplements and compounds are the same. There are so many different types of magnesium and here's just a list of a few. Magnesium citrate, glycinate, chloride, lactate, malate, taurate, sulfate, oxide, and magnesium threonate. Forms of magnesium that dissolve well in liquid are more completely absorbed in the gut than the less soluble forms. Small studies have found that magnesium in the aspartate, citrate, lactate, and chloride forms is better absorbed and is more bioavailable than magnesium oxide and magnesium sulfate. So some magnesium is better absorbed than others. Let's take a look at some of them. Magnesium glycinate. It's a magnesium and glycine compound and is very bioavailable and easily absorbed. Some research on magnesium glycinate indicate that people tolerated it well and it had minimal side effects. This means it is a really good option for people who need a higher dose of magnesium and who may experience side effects when using other derivatives. Magnesium glycinate is actually a really, really good one. Magnesium citrate, it is pretty effective at being absorbed and it increases magnesium levels. And it is one of the more popular forms and used in a lot of dietary supplements. If you are getting just a generic magnesium, it's very likely it will be magnesium citrate. It's often used as a laxative, however, as it relaxes the bowels and pulls water into them very gently. In terms of constipation, it is a pretty decent laxative and more natural form than some of the others that you do find. However, if you consume too much, it can have a laxative effect. So if that is not the goal, I would definitely think about supplementing with a different magnesium. I do want to talk about magnesium l 3 because it is slightly different. It can be referred to as magtine and is a compound that has been shown to increase magnesium levels in the brain and increase neuron activity. So it is brain magnesium. It has been shown to increase
increase memory and cognitive function. It does come with a hefty price tag though. Moving on to the one vitamin everyone should be taking. Are you getting enough vitamin D? Vitamin D deficiency is one of the most prevalent deficiencies worldwide. In the US alone, 42% of adults are deficient, while 50% of children between ages one and five are deficient also. That is some pretty high numbers in both adults and children, especially with the importance of vitamin D. One of the main roles it plays is regulating calcium absorption, which is why it's vital for bone development and strength. It's also good for immune health, brain function, regulating inflammation and the nervous system regulation. But one of the things I think is very interesting is its benefit for immune function, as there is research correlating vitamin D deficiency with increased severity of viral and respiratory infections. So just by having adequate vitamin D, you could be better off when it comes to illness severity. But how do you know if you're vitamin D deficient? Some of the symptoms do include fatigue, frequent illness, anxiety, bone pain, and slower wound healing. But the best option is to get your levels tested by a doctor. The best, cheapest, and easiest way to get vitamin D is from the sun. Vitamin D can be found in the tiniest amounts in food, but it's so tiny, it just doesn't count. You cannot get adequate amounts from food, so therefore you need to either get it from the sun or supplement it. When it comes to the sun, we have been so overcautious of sun safety and skin cancer. SPF has taken over and there is a trend towards zero sun exposure without protection. However, you can't absorb the vitamin D if you're blocking it with a sunscreen. So there needs to be a healthy balance of bare skin sun exposure in hours where the UV index is low and you really don't want to burn. So yes, sun safety is ultra important, but to get your vitamin D, we want to be looking at sun exposure in the early hours of the morning or the afternoon when UV isn't as bad. Otherwise, if the sun isn't an option, like in some places through winter, it may be beneficial to supplement to avoid deficiency. It could make a huge difference to your health. You can't just skip a balanced diet because you're on supplements. Good food with high nutrient content and low toxins is pretty much the gold standard. Supplements, as the name suggests, are just supplemental. They are side additions. They were created to mimic and break down the absorption of nutrients in food. Supplements are no way near as easily absorbed as food nutrients. Food without supplementation is ultimately the goal, but isn't always an option with the decreased nutrient content in fruits and veg today. So where supplementation may now be required, it is not an excuse to take supplements and eat crap. Highly processed food and packaged foods are often very low in nutrients and high in toxins. Supplements aren't gonna fix a toxic problem. So trying to eat foods that are naturally filled with water soluble and fat soluble vitamins and minerals is ideal. Not foods that are fortified with vitamins that are basically supplements themselves. Fortified foods are foods that have had vitamins and minerals added to them. And the reason they've had to be fortified is because they're nutrient poor foods or nutrient dead foods to begin with. So they don't actually have any nutrients. So people have pumped them full of synthetic nutrients to make them seem healthy. Nutrigrain's an example. It's a cereal marketed as healthy and nutrient filled. It's only marketed that way because they fortify or artificially pump the cereal with these nutrients. It's not natural, nor is the high sugar content. So don't be fooled by the cringe marketing of packaged foods. Bad foods taste good, but it's not worth chronic disease. It's also important to note that not all nutrients in food are absorbed equally. For example, spinach versus steak. Spinach has a slightly higher amount of iron comparatively to steak per 100 grams. However, you absorb significantly more iron in the steak than you do in the spinach. So you would basically need to consume kilos of spinach to get the same nutrient benefit. But no one's going to do that, nor should anyone do that, as they might die of oxalate poisoning from the spinach. If you're going to be consuming spinach, I wouldn't say it would be for the iron content. If you are someone who's only eating plant foods, you may need to supplement more than someone who's only eating meat and animal products, purely from a nutrient absorption perspective. If you like this video, subscribe and check out this video right here where I talk about nine weight loss mistakes you're probably making. It's evidence-based and has a lot of interesting info that you might find helpful, even if you're not trying to lose weight. I found it really, really interesting, the research that I discovered in it. I will see you in the next one.